Father, we are so grateful that we can gather here this morning as your people to worship you. And now we want to worship you by listening to your words. May your spirit lead and guide, help us to enter into your truth. And help me, Lord, and to be uh, able to articulate the message clearly and help all of us to be able to grasp it at the end of the day that, you know, uh, in the right response to this, your words, to who you are, is to worship you, to glorify you, and to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we come to our final session. Uh, it will be Life by the Spirit. And which will be taken from, uh, we we'll look into the passage, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 25. When a person encounters the gospel for a period of time, he becomes aware of his sins, realizes that he can't be saved by his own good works, understand that he needs to be saved, recognize that Jesus is the only God and Savior that can save him, and will respond to the gospel by confession, repentance, and faith in Christ Jesus alone. Not just because Jesus is his helper or healer, but Jesus as his Savior and Lord. So begins a new life or new nature in Christ. This is a regenerated life by the Holy Spirit, forgiven by Christ, covered with the righteousness of Christ, and given the right to become a child of God. Therefore, as Christian, legally, we are perfect in God's sight because we are forgiven and given the righteousness of Christ. Christ not only bears our sins, but also gives us His perfect life, His perfect righteousness to us. However, in our present reality, we are not yet actually righteous. We are still imperfect and fall into sins because we live in this fallen world and still have residual of sin. Our old sinful nature still has root. The reality is that we are living in what we call the already not yet, already redeemed, righteous in Christ, but not actually or fully righteous yet. As a result, we continue to struggle with obedience to God in our everyday lives. So the question is, how can we overcome such struggles? How can we subdue our old sinful nature? What happens if we don't? What happens if we subdue it? So if you have Bible with you, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 25. From this passage, we can learn and understand how our old sinful nature functions, how to overcome it by learning to be, live a life that is led by the Spirit so that we can grow in Christ and live out the character of Christ. So first, let's look at the conflict between the flesh and the Spirit. In this passage, Paul indicates to us that there are two natures at work in every Christian, which are sinful nature and the Spirit. These two natures are totally opposite and hostile toward each other. As Christians, we should obey the Holy Spirit. And this is why Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The word sinful nature or the, the desire of the flesh here, here in, uh, in ESV is desire of the flesh comes from Greek word sar, which older English Bible version translate as flesh or ESV translate as flesh. Contemporary Bible tends to translate it as sinful nature. The flesh in the New Testament does not refer to our physical 
or material nature, but to the sin desiring aspect of our whole being in opposition to the God desiring aspect. Therefore, SARS, the flesh, is our sinful heart. It is the aspect of our hearts are not yet renewed by the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, Paul says that the spirit and the flesh are in conflict with each other. At first glance, it seems that this is a battle between something inside us, our sinful nature, and outside us, the Holy Spirit. But since Paul talks of each side producing quality within us in verses 19 to 23, which we'll we look at it later, and because his language stressed two kinds of desire in verses 17, it is evident that this, complex, uh, this conflict takes place within us. Therefore, the spirit could be thought of as the Christian heart renewed by the Holy Spirit. Our sinful nature was there before we were Christians. However, the Spirit entered supernaturally when we first became Christian and has begun a renewal that is our new nature. The Apostle Paul referred to these two natures as the old man and the new man, and often translated as old self or new self. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. These two natures are at war with each other. Now the question is, what is the nature of their battle? It is a battle of desires between God's spirit and the flesh or the sinful nature. Or you can say it's a battle between the old man and the new man. In both verses, in both verses 16 and 24, Paul used the Greek word epitomia to describe the desire of the flesh. In the older translation, this word was translated as lust, okay, which led the English reader to think of sexual desire only. In modern translation, the word is translated desires. Literally, epitomia means an over-desire. Right? An inordinate desire or excessive desire, an over-desire, an all-conquering drive and longing. And this is crucial. It means that the main problem in our heart is not so much of desire of bad things, but an over-desire of good things. Sins creates within us the feeling that we must have this or that. If we don't have this or that, we think we can't survive. Now, we think we can't survive if we are to live without this good thing. When a good thing becomes our God or salvation, when we think we've got to have this thing to have, you know, to, to, we've got to have it in order to have meaning or worth or significance, it creates an over-desire. As a result, this good thing becomes what we call our idol. An idol is a thing that you over-desire, and it replaces the place of God. And you think that this other thing, you've got to have it in order to give you meaning, worth, or significance. And very often, this over-desire, these good things, or either that drive us and control us. The desire of the flesh elevates that good thing to the status of God, then to live without it means loss of self, security, meaning, significance, worth, and fulfillment. This excessive desire over a good thing is not good for us because it denies God is all we need. God is the one that can truly give us the meaning, the significance, the worth or value that we desire. It tells us that having God is not good enough. Just like the Galatians, having a 
you know, gospel is not good. You've got to add something on. Yeah. So apart from Christ, we need other good things like career, children, appearance, car, education, marriage, or money to make us valuable, secure, significant, or fulfilled. We build our identity or worth on these good things apart from God. As a result, we will do whatever it takes, even, that mean, that even the means doesn't justify the end, to get what we think is the most important things in our lives. In reality, even if achieve what we desire, we will eventually become discontented because these created things, these good things are created things that can never take the place of their creator. The Spirit's desire, however, is contrary to the desire of the flesh. Look at verse 17, which says, For the desire of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Interestingly, that Paul doesn't actually say the Spirit over desires. Okay? How could the Spirit in order to desire anything? Yet the construction of the sentence indicates that the Spirit has strong passion and yearning as well, at least as strong as the flesh. So what is it that the Spirit longs for? John in chapter, uh, sorry, Jesus in, chapter, uh, in John chapter 16, 14, teaches that the Holy Spirit will come into the world to bring glory to me. That means bring the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus. Well, our flesh glorifies, adores, or lusts after all kinds of created things, conditions, and people. The Spirit glorifies and yawns for Christ. The Spirit speaks of the beauties and greatness of Jesus Christ. The Spirit's desire is to point us to Jesus, telling us that our fulfillment, our significance, our worth is found in Jesus alone. The Spirit longs to show us Christ and to conform, conform us to Christ so that our lives can be transformed and live in life with the truth of the gospel. This is the Spirit's desire, and it should be all Christians' desire. It's easy for us to look uh, to uh, for us to overlook, but Paul makes an extremely telling statement when he say they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. This is a parallel passage message to Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, when he says, For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that draws in my members. In other words, the Spirit is what we most deeply want, yet the sinful nature continues to create alternate desires that we experience and must resist. The reborn person, a born-again Christian, then has both sinful desires and godly wants. But we most truly want what the spirit nature wants. In other words, there are two opposing forces constantly pulling us apart. A Christian life is a const, is constant battle or struggle of following God. If this is how you feel now, and you may be discouraged, and let me tell you, this is normal. This is normal for every Christian, which means that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. That's why you're struggling. It's as if because you feel pain. I went out to run yesterday. I tripped over and I fell and I feel pain. It means I'm alive. You know, if you feel pain, it means you're alive, right? Only the dead people don't feel pain, right? If you're struggling, to following God, praise God, that means 
you are alive in Him. That's why you are struggling. And to overcome this tug of war, we need to be led and walk by the Spirit. To further help us to obey and rely on the Spirit to overcome the desire of the flesh, Paul shows us how our sinful nature, that means SARS, operates and what motivates it. Paul says in verse 18, but if you are but if you are led by the Spirit, can you change to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, this one, okay? If you look at verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Notice there are striking similarity between verses 18 and 16. Notice the parallelism. Verse 16 is, if you walk by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, versus not gratify the desire of the flesh. Verse 18, led by the Spirit, versus not under the law. In verse 16, being led by Spirit is in contrast with the sinful nature or desire of the flesh. But in verse 18, being led by the Spirit is contrast with being under the law. For Paul, these two things are very closely linked or perhaps even different ways of talking about the same thing. If you are not being led by the Spirit, then you are gratifying the flesh and live under the law. What is under the law? We've been talking about in the last two days. Right? It means to rely on myself, my own performance, like obeying the law and not relying on God's grace alone to achieve my salvation. You see, the sinful nature within us wants us to be our own saviour. The flesh, then, is how the heart continues to function under the law, how it continues to reject the free gift of salvation, the free gift of Christ's righteousness, and continues to seek its own way. In other words, instead of trusting Christ's righteousness, I trust my own righteousness. You know, I, I try to build my own righteousness so that I don't have to rely on, my, on Christ's righteousness. And I look to these other things to build up my own righteousness so that I, I can save myself and I don't have to rely on Christ to save me. I trust my own performance or achievement to build up my significance or worth and achieve my own salvation so that I don't have to rely on God's grace, which is the free gifts of Christ's righteousness. Ted Keller put it this way. Kim Keller put it this way. Therefore, they say, the sin beneath all sins, that is the motive for our disobedience, is always a lack of trust in God's grace and goodness and a desire to protect and guard our own lives through self-salvation. All right? So let me give you a ex personal example. Uh, I'm going to use this. I know my daughters have heard it so many times. <laughs> so my, they have to bear with me. Okay. Back in 2020, okay, late 2020, you know, we are all in pandemic, right? Yeah, I know my daughter said, oh, not again, but uh, sorry, girls. <laughs> all right. Now, now in, and so what happened in pa during the pandemic in, in 2020? We all have to be, what, stay at home, right? Th there's no church service. And pretty much all churches, their service is online. You watch the TV, right? Now, is it easy to worship online? No, actually, it's very easy to get distracted, right? So to help us to stay focused, I told my daughters uh, and, and my, uh, my son at the time, my fourth son, uh, my, uh, my, my fourth child still with us. Um, I say, okay, if you want to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom before we start the worship, okay? Watch the worship. And then you want to get a cup of drinks, get it, and put your phone on silence. Uh, don't look at your phone, okay? Just focus, you know? So on that particular Sunday, we, I said the same thing. Said we sit down and watch the worship. And then toward the end of the worship, lo and behold, my phone begins to buzz. Even though I turn it silent, you know, the vibrate, you can feel it. So I can't resist myself. And I took the phone and looked at it. And guess what? 
my daughter called me. <laughs> Say, Dad, you look at the phone. Now, think of how, what do you think, how, how I will respond to that? Or maybe I should phrase the question. If you were me, how would you respond? You're pretty honest. Right? <laughs> now, <laughs> well, actually, you know what I said to her? Without thinking through my default mode, my must, my, you know, just a kind of reflex, I burst out, no. <laughs> Means I'm not walk looking at the phone. Uh, that's what I told her. And then, you know, what she, then what she said to me, you know, when you, ca when you catch your father made a mistake, don't let him go, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So he say, she said, show me the phone. <laughs> and now, you know what my mind was thinking at the moment? You know, our memory process very fast. I was trying to think of what are the valid excuses, thousands of excuses like, you know what? I'm opening the Bible in my phone app. You know, I, wa I want to try to tell him that. Now, let's stop here for a moment. Now, I'm slowing up, okay? Why I'm saying no to her? Why? Actually, I'm lying. Yeah, okay? Why I'm lying to her? Without even thinking. You know what I'm trying to do? Actually, I'm trying to protect my own righteousness. I'm relying on my flesh. You know, faith is more important, and, and that's my longing. And I'm trying to grab hold of that and protect it. I'm relying on myself. My flesh at the moment took over. Right? So, you see, this uh, example like this, if we are honest, happen to us very often in our everyday life. So in light of this, this example, you know, we can see that the two nature Paul speak of are really two intact of motivational system with us. Okay? A motivational system is centered on a goal that the imagination finds beautiful and desirable. This goal generates what perceived as need and drives for it. And the sinful nature is really our own motivational system with its own goals and that's its own needs and drive and still somewhat intact. You know, I, my goal is to protect my face, my own righteousness. You know, it's so, what, so losing face, right? You know, get caught by your daughter. Right? So in, that, in this regard, our sinful nature or the desire of the flesh tell us that having Jesus is not good enough. You know, he can't cover it for you. You know, you got to rely on your own. You must have this other thing or object or achieve this goal in order to be acceptable, in order to be significant and valuable. So as I mentioned before, in Galatian church, the believers were told apart from trusting Jesus, they must observe the law in order to be more acceptable to God. And today, we are told that we must continue to pursue the things of the world such as education, career, material position, possession, or, or any other things, then only our life will be more significant or valuable. For the irreligious, their work is ba based on doing whatever they like without restriction. For the religious, oh, you must serve God, come to church, worship, or read your Bible in order to feel like you are a good Christian. This nature is under the law, self-salvation, which depends on our own performance to build our worth or save ourselves. And generally, the object or the thing we pursue itself is good. Yeah. Now, there's nothing wrong to study hard. Okay? But our sinful desire, our flesh, turns it into an idol by which we seek our salvation or significance. Oh, I can have it. I can have what if I am loved or I have a good career. Then I feel I'm significant. I'm somebody. Or I need my children to perform well. 
then only I feel that I'm a good success parent. And which finally, now, all those things are not wrong in itself, but if you attach your identity in all those things, which will find, create a drive and over-desires for it, it will become a problem if your identity is based on all those things, for, for example, or your, school's, uh, your children's school performance. If your children perform well, wow, you feel good. If your children don't perform well, you feel sad, right? If we operate under this kind of life or live, uh, it lives the time, we all will always fluctuate between inferiority and superiority, and, and, and we will be enslaved by them, enslaved by our, our own idol. Right. Now, how do you know your idol? Let me give you a t- three quick question to help you to reflect. So, if you are angry, I don't have that slide. Okay. So, if you are angry, ask yourself, is that something too important to me? Something I'm telling myself I have to have? Is that why I'm angry? Because I'm blocked from having something I think is a necessary when it is not. Just like yesterday when I shared with you, I calling my children down, they don't come down, I get angry. Yeah, because they are blocking that something I want to have. Now, if you are fearful or worry all the time, if you go go to bed at night, you just keep worry and worry and worry. So, ask yourself: Is that something too important to me? Something I'm telling myself I got to have. Is that why I'm so scared? Because something is being threatened, which is which I think is necessary when it is not. Or you are despondent or hating yourself. Is that something too important to me? Something I'm telling myself, I got to have. Is that why I'm so down? Because I have lots of fear as something which I think is necessary when it is not. So these are some uh, starter questions to help you to identify your own idols. Now, when you're buying, if, you, if we don't do something about right, it, if we've been led by our own sinful nature and being controlled and slaved by our idols, which will lead to the consequences outlined by Paul in verses 19 to 21. Look at verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I want you, as I want you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here, Paul shows us the inordinate desire and over-desires brought about by our flesh not only affect our attitudes, but also our behavior. Let me give you a few examples of how the desire of the flesh affects our attitude and behavior. First, sexual immorality. Let me, let's say that my flesh has an excessive desire to a sex. It tells me that if I want true fulfillment, I must have an active sex life and have different partners. And the flesh elevates sex, which is a good thing created by God, to, to a God. Since I need sex to have a fulfilled life, I'm willing to violate my wedding while and sleep around. Such is sexual immorality. Next, feast of anger. I have an over desire for a good life like Malaysian dream. Yeah, to feel that if I can achieve my Malaysian dream, then I have worth. I'm significant. I'm somebody. Unfortunately, that I'm unable to reach my dream. As a result, I become very angry and bitter. I hate everybody around me because I keep I project that they are the one that stop me from pursuing the dream, right? Or and it also make me jealous of anyone who I think has a better life. Yeah. You know? uh, back to uh, the children's performance. You know, if ah oh, my children perform SPM got five A's, I feel very good. Then the next day I found out that you know my neighbor's child got nine A's. Oh, my heart begin to sing. Right. Yeah. So idolatry. Next, here the idolatry to refer to idol worship here because it's next to witchcraft, and some people desire to have a lot of money, therefore they worship various idols in the temple. Yeah. Let me ask you, who is their idol? Uh, who is their savior? 
whom they really trust. Power is money, right? Yeah. The idols they worship is just a mean to an end. If the idol in the temple they worship can't deliver them the money, they will change to a different idol or go to a different temple and worship. Right? It's very similar to our worship. It's, it's uh, another worship, uh, uh, worship of what they call the posterity gospel, right? which I'm not going to get into it, but you all know what I mean. All right? Okay, then faction or division. I'm eager to get people's recognition, so I form a faction with a group of people entering their circle, get their recognition so that I feel valuable, right? That's why we have so many professional society. Uh, now, nothing wrong against that, all right? But some people, sometimes we feel that, oh, I got to get into this professional society to meet, feel like, oh, I need to join this club. Oh, this club is only for the who's who's. Wow, if I get into this club, wow, everybody will look at me differently, all right? So sometimes we, yes, I, we create division. Now, when we follow the desire of our flesh, our lives will produce the attitudes and the behavior Paul mentioned in verses 19 to 21. And such life is very insecure, often fluctuate between inferiority and superiority, and this is the result of following the flesh. And Paul then warned his reader in verses 21. He said, I want you as I want you before, that those who... Do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is saying that if you continue to live like this and don't feel anything wrong, you don't understand the gospel at all. And that, therefore, you have no true repentance and are not born again by the Holy Spirit and can't enter the kingdom of God. However, if your heart constantly struggles, especially toward the desire or the temptation of the flesh, willing to confess and repent toward your wrong attitude or behavior, and more importantly, to confess your self-righteousness and lack of trust toward God, it means you that you have the evidence of being saved. Another evidence of salvation that you bear the fruit of the Spirit. This is the result of believing the gospel, being led by the Spirit and submitting to the Spirit. Paul says in verses 22 to 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is one but has different traits or characters. And it represents different traits of the Christian life. These characters are perfectly displayed in Jesus Christ. The ultimate purpose of spirit work in the Christian is to change us into the likeness and character of Christ. Paul says in Romans 8.29, He, that means God, predestined us to, co to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. In other words, as we walk with the Spirit, our lives will grow to become more like Christ by displaying these Christ-like characters, fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The Spirit doesn't create these Christ-like characters in us all at once. We change gradually from one degree of likeness to the next. Therefore, our sanctification is a process. The fruit growth of the Spirit can only happen in a child of God. So, the only real evidence that the Spirit has indwelled you as a child of God is your growth in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a closer look at some of the characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which are the result of trusting the gospel, submitting to the Holy Spirit, and applying the gospel. Let me give you some examples. First, let's look at joy. Through the gospel, God is my Heavenly Father. And I'm his child. His love to me is unconditional. He sent Jesus to die for my sin. He redeemed me. From now on, God is all that I need. I delight in him and his salvation. He is my satisfaction. In him, I have joy and peace. Even I don't have any other things. When I lose or gain the good things this world offer me, I remain joyful 
because my joy is based on my relationship with the Father as well as His promises to me. My joy in Him is not based on circumstances. Who am I or what I have in this world no longer matter to me because I have Christ. He is my joy. Also, joy derived from the Spirit will rejoice rather than envy or jealous over the good things that happen to others, right? such as their success or accomplishment. So one indication, do you celebrate other people's success? Do you rejoice with them? Or do you feel sour in your heart? Another example, gentleness, which has the meaning of humility and self-forgetfulness. The gospel shows me that I have been accepted and approved by God to Christ. I have His approval. I don't need to seek the approval of others or feel that I must be better than him or her. Nor do I need to trample on others to succeed in building my worth. God not only sees me, but also knows me. Do you really believe that He knows you? We all know Agong, right? Do you know Agong? The Agong of Malaysia? In a way, we all know him, right? He's the Sultan of Selangor, right? I'm uh, sorry, Sultan of Johor, right? <laughs> Sultan of Johor. I'm from Selangor, okay. <laughs> he's Sultan of Johor, right? We all know that he's, he's Sultan of Johor. Now, you know him, right? Yeah, we, in a way, we can't know him. But you know what? If he knows you, it makes all the difference. Do you notice that? We can, oh, sometimes we will try to brag, you know, oh, I know so-and-so, I know Michelle Yeo. Oh, Michelle Yeo is from Malaysia. And somebody comes in, oh, yeah, I know Michelle Yeo. That's great, you know, Michelle Yeo know me. <laughs> right? That makes the difference. You see that? My brothers and sisters, God, the Most High, knows you. If you truly understand that, you no longer need to seek to be noticed all the time or be the center of attention. This is because your identity, security, satisfaction, significance, and value comes from your relationship with God. You see that? Lastly, we want to see how can the fruit of the Spirit take root in our lives. Let's look at the key to follow the Spirit. The key of following the Spirit. If we want our lives to be transformed and bear fruit, we need to listen to Paul's word in verses 24 to 25. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we want to submit to the Spirit, walk with the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, and bear fruit, fruit, there are three things we need to do or we need to be aware of. First, in verse 24, we remind us that first, we must remember we belong to Christ. He said, those who belong to Christ Jesus. So we got to remember we belong to Christ. Because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, we've been accepted by God, our Heavenly Father. His acceptance of us is not based on our character or behavior, but on Christ's perfect righteousness. Therefore, when we succumb to our sinful nature, we can admit it. When we refuse to walk with the Spirit, we can repent because we know our action will not affect God's love for us or God's approval of us. Second, because we belong to Christ, we have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. The flesh with its passion and desire refers to excessive desire. As said before, the flesh is a sinful nature that rejects salvation by grace and insists of self-salvation, therefore turning some good things into either Savior which we then over-desire. 
So crucifying the flesh is really the identification and dismantling the idol. So we got to identify and dismantle our idols if we want to walk with the spirit. It means to put an end to the rule and attractive power that idols have in our lives and therefore to destroy their ability and to, re- to inflame our thoughts and desires. On one of Callus' quotes, he said, Real changes in our life cannot proceed without discerning one's characteristic flesh, the particular idols and desires that come from it. So as I said before, we have to ask ourselves, not just what we do wrong, you know, but why we do it wrong. So often we focus on external behavior. We didn't go far enough. We got to ask ourselves why we do it wrong. Very often the bottom line is we disobey God in order to get something we feel we have to have. This and there's an over-desire, epitomia. Now the question is, why do we have to have it? Because it is a way we are trying to keep under the law, try to rely on ourselves. It's something that we have to come to believe will validate us. So my idol, one of my big idols is approval. So we go back to the example with my daughter. Right? So I want to protect I want to get approval from others or even from her. So I lie. I have no courage to admit wrong. So to crucify the flesh is to say, Lord, my heart thinks that I, I have to have this or that or I'm worthless. Yet this thing is pseudo savior. They are fake savior. We have fake news. They are, these are fake savior. When I'm yearning for it, I have forgotten what I meant to you. As you show me in Christ, I have forgotten your love to me, forgotten what Christ has done for me. Oh Lord, forgive me. By your Spirit, I will reflect on your love for me in Christ until this thing loses its attractive power over my soul, until I can rest in Christ. At the moment, I got to preach the gospel to myself. Back to the example. As I try to continue to find excuses to justify my behavior, and I dawn again, the uh, uh, kind of spirit prompting on me is like, hey, Gideon, you know, you're going back to your self default mode. You have forgotten what I have accomplished for you. So rather, instead of keep fighting, you know, before then, in the past, I'll say, how dare you dare to ch- look at my phone, you know? How dare you, you know, this is my phone, right? Now, uh, and I just keep quiet and humble myself and then later apologize to her. Yeah. It takes time, you know, uh, because it wasn't my, d- um, it's still not my default. So someone, let me put this, let me un- go ahead and answer the question. Someone uh, asked me, uh, I think yesterday, say, Pastor, you talk about preaching the gospel to yourself, applying gospel to yourself. It seems so, it, it is a very tedious, very slow, right? You know, and, and it's like, well, let me, s- let me say this. Actually, I, I'm slowing down you know, because I'm trying to analyze it for you, right? I'm slowing it down, right? But actually, in reality, it happened very fast, all right? Now, the reason why I react so quick and burst out the word saying no, because that was my habit, old habit, right? And now the question, now I need to cultivate new habit. So to cultivate new habit at the very beginning, you will fumble all the time, you, you struggle, and that's common, right? But you got to keep practice. I got to keep learning. And then until to a point that you will become part of my uh, habit or internal, ma- I, I got to internalize it. Right? So you got to keep practicing. Practicing. Right? If, you learn, if you want to learn any sport, uh, you got to repeat the same actions over and over again until you internalize it. Right? So likewise, same thing in our Christian walk. We've got to cultivate new habit until it becomes part of us, internalized, w- so that when the same situation, similar situation happen again, instead of it bursts up saying no, at the moment you say, yeah, that's right, I blew it, sorry, thank you for reminding me, or thank you for pointing out to me, right? You will have the courage to uh, humble yourself and the humility to, humble to admit the wrong, 
because you know by admitting wrong, it will not change who you are in Christ. Right? So, lastly, we must keep in step with the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit means something more than simple, simple obedience, though it is not less than that. Verse 25 literally says we must keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit is a living person who glorifies and magnifies the work of Christ. Remember at the beginning I say, Spirit's job is to glorify Christ. So Spirit's job is to glorify Christ and magnifies the work of Christ. What is greatest work? The cross. Right? So once we, the, once we specifically find the particular false beliefs of our flesh that generate the over-desire and lead us to sin, we must repent and turn to the gospel and replace them with Christ. So at the moment when my daughter, I got to say, you know, Jesus has secured things for me. You know, my righteousness is found in Him, not in my own, not relying on my own effort. You know, I need to repent at a time and then trust, repent and believe and trust what Christ has already accomplished for me. And, rep- in, 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 so you got to replace that either with Christ. This is not an intellectual exercise. We must worship Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit, remember His love, adoring Him until our hearts find Him more beautiful than the object we felt we got to have. So when you do that, keep doing that. Then, just as the song say, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world. What? will gradually lose or become deems or lose its grips on you. So we must remember His grace. We must let the Word of God drown in our hearts, meditate upon God's Word and set our hearts on things above. As we do that, we will find Christ more and more beautiful and precious and the idols will lose its grip on us. As we put away our flesh, you will make room for the fruit of the Holy Spirit to grow in us and we will notice that fruit is glowing, which enables to live out the likeness of Christ. And then you will become more and more patient and you will become more and more loving. Right. It's a process. So, In this passage, Paul shows us that we can be transformed by the gospel. It begins with understanding how the flesh functions and recognizing our functional idols and then remove it by crucifying the flesh and be led by the Spirit in meditating upon the gospel, what Christ has done for us, and then apply the gospel into our lives by repenting of our own self-righteousness and trusting the righteousness of Christ. Luther says that for a Christian, all of life is a joyful repentance. How do you know you're growing in Christ? You repent more and more. Many years ago, when, when I remember the pastors in a prayer meeting say, okay, think of a sin you want to confess, you know, in a prayer meeting, and then confess to the Lord. I was sitting there thinking, huh, I can't think of anything I can confess. <laughs> but a growing Christian will be sensitive to his sin and it will always be a life, a, a life of ongoing repentance. You'll be quick to catch it. In the past, I can argue with my wife for many days. But now, by God's grace, you know, sometimes I, get, I still want to resist, uh, you know, fighting with her, argue with her for like uh, half an hour. And then later, I thought, oh, no, I shouldn't. You know, I got to, you know. Now, at least I'm making a progress so from several days, right, to, to half an hour, right? <laughs> so you're making progress, right? Yeah. So the question is how quick you catch it? How fast you catch it, right? So you see, you know, that's the beauty of the gospel. That's hope. As we continue to practice it, and then we will, the, the godly character will produce it, and we'll have a healthy, uh, a, you know, a healthy habit in us. As we do this in our daily lives, we'll gradually be transformed into Christ's line. We'll begin to see 
that we are indeed living and abundant and free life. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. And thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us, continue to work in our life, despite sometimes how we feel about ourselves. You redeem us, even though sometimes we are at the bottom of the pit. You didn't give up on us, but raise us, raise us up with Christ. Thank you. Help us to continue to find, to, to be kept, by the beauty of Christ, by who He is, so that our heart will continue yearn for Him and follow Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.